So they're actually, so the current, yes, we're going to move right to that. You're, you're just anticipating me perfectly. All right. So the current way is BMI. Doctors do that right now. It obviously has its flaws, right? So what are some other ways that people are, are proposing, like this is the way we really should be measuring um, for obesity and health risk, all right? So one of them is, yes, is uh, waist, waist circumference, right? It's historically known that pair, uh, pair fat, so fat at the hips and the buttocks, is actually less, uh, un is better for you than apple fat, so ap a fat around the core, all right? And they actually had done medical studies and say, OK, if you just measure waist circumference, if you have a lower waist circumference, you have a lower prevalence of a lot of health indicators, a lot of medical problems. So you have lower risk of diabetes, lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of hypertension. And if you have, again, higher waist circumference, you have a higher risk of each of those things. All right, so that's one way to measure it. That's probably better than BMI. Okay? And so here are some recommended guidelines for that. Waste chart for men and women. You can take a look at this in, in your lecture slides. Another one, which is a little more refined, is actually waist to hip ratio. Okay? So I can just see circumference to your waist divided by circumference to your hip. You get a ratio. And this is actually, they've done studies on this, and they, this is actually much better cor correlated even than just waist circumference itself with prevalence of diseases. All right? So in this chart, you have. Um, on the x-axis, you're a person with average um, waist hip ratios or average BMI or average waist circumference, and then one and two standard deviations away. And how that's correlated with health uh, hazard risk, health risks of cardiovascular disease, coronary disease in both men and women. Right? And you can see that the waist hip ratio is actually a better predictor of, um, of health risk than either the, just the waist by itself or the BMI. Right. So here is just another chart for you guys for kind of what the ideal for low, moderate, and high uh, disease risk related to obesity, obesity of hip to waist ratio is. Now again, these are have their papers coming out that say this is a better measure than BMI. Um, it's really hard to get the medical community to kind of overturn over fifty over fifty years of just this is what we do. Right, so people still measure BMI and associate it with health, with health risks related to obesity. It's not that accurate. People know it's not accurate, but people still do it, even though we know there are better measures out there. Right, so this is kind of like where people are starting to break that down right now. Like, hey, we shouldn't be using this. Hey, we should be using something else that's a better predictor. Shivani, do you have a question? The thing is, bone is not a really heavy part of you. So it, it has not that, not that huge of an effect. Unless you have, again, bone disorders. Then they would have. But like bones tend to actually be less, uh, again, lighter than your muscle. So muscle is your, actually, muscle and water are like the two biggest things that contribute to weight. But this is why you see like when wrestlers, they need to make weight for something, they'll like just lose a bunch of water. Not obviously good for you, but you can do that because you can look, when you want to lose a lot of weight quickly, it's very easy to lose water weight. Any other questions? All right, so move on to molecular control. Talk about two systems here, the homeostatic system, the, what's basically um, the subconscious thing that's regulating your appetite, regulating your, your ability to uh, think about food, and then the hedonist, hedonistic system. This is something that you've actually, that you actively control. Okay. Yes? How easy do you think it is to measure body fat accurately? So, mm -hmm. so how do they measure it? Right, they do little flabs. How do they do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds very advanced. So how, how many, uh, so yes, you can actually very accurately measure body fat via that kind of technology. However, yeah, and as you said, a scale like that's $500. Um, think about how much most scales cost, period. Right. You can understand that like, most people don't do that or can't have access to that, right? So yes, you can accurately measure body fat just by actually uh, doing a calculation of voltage. 
but that's a very expensive technology. Now, if you do physicals, most people will do like you know the fold check. Yeah. They'll give you that little cal caliper thing. Very inaccurate, but it's like the best cheap thing they can, they can do, right? So that's why they don't really measure. It's hard to measure total body fat. That's the problem. It's, it's the, the measurement is not trivial. Yeah. Do you have a question? How many, okay, so this is actually a good question. So you're talking about $500 for a scale. How many exam rooms exist in a hospital? How many of those do they have to buy for every single exam room? So, so that, that's actually very true, that you can do it in a hospital. What about a doctor's office? What about a clinic? What about some other location where you're actually taking a physical? So it, it's something like technology that you could probably get very easily in a hospital. But if you're talking about trying to do this in a rolling clinic or something that like, you know, your funds are short, it's probably harder to do. So there's a practical matter of economics here. And what's, like maybe $500 is not expensive for a hospital in the United States. Try going to India and doing that. So there's a big difference there. Yes, Maya. Again, th these are all great points, and I don't have an answer to you for some of the reasons why, but there's a lot of, you're not talking about things that are always logical, right? There's probably policy initiatives, thoughts, and, and the reasons that are against that, which I actually have no idea, all right? So yes, you, what you guys are proposing are fairly good common sense solutions to diagnosis, okay? Um, but they, remember the thing about that, you have to be able to, one, make it really easy and accessible, and you have to convince people that it's something they should be doing. Like remember the prop, remember um, for the last lecture I talked about you know fecal transplantation? That seems like a good solution. Think about how hard it is to convince people to do it. Right? It's probably similar to here. Like the, there's inertia in one direction. Like people have done BMI for decades, so that's what everyone knows. And trying to change that is actually very difficult because you're trying to change a societal habit. Right? Everyone, like if you look at every single health study, it's all about BMI, BMI, BMI. So trying to change that over time is going to take a lot of time, take a lot of effort, take a, basically take a societal shift. All right? And I don't have the answers for you on that, how to do that. It's something that's interesting to think about. All right, sorry, we've gone a little far in this conversation. I'm going to move on. All right, so when we're talking about uh, molecular control, it's for something like a problem like obesity, it's an interplay between these organs. Okay, you have your brain, you have your stomach, your intestine, your pancreas, and the fat itself, the adipose tissue. Okay? And you can see there's a lot of molecules involved, a lot of crosstalk. I want to focus on three particular molecules in particular, because these are actually, I think, three, three of the core ones. So you have leptin here, which is produced by your fat, ghrelin, which is produced by your stomach, and insulin, which is produced by your, by your pancreas. Okay? I'm simplifying, just to let you know, because of uh, time issues. You can talk about all these other things, like the vaginal efferent CCK, which was talked about in, uh, by Dr. Dizaroff in the gastrointestinal lecture. I won't focus on them. If you want to talk, know more about them, I would look them up in your own, in your own time. But I'm going to talk about these three, OK? So first off, leptin, insulin. These are your SADI signals. These are the signals that tell you you're full. All right, so obviously, um, leptin is produced by your fat. Pancreas produces insulin. Those signals go into your brain, into the hypothalamus, where they interact with a, uh, I don't know exactly the names of these neurons. I'm sure Dr. Dushroff will know. But they interact with neurons to basically um, regulate your appetite and actually regulate your, your food, food, uh, food intake. All right, so when you have high levels of insulin and leptin, you reduce food intake and you actually increase energy expenditure. You also signal to your liver, if you have high levels of insulin, to stop glu glucose production, right? So, you obviously, you don't want to release more glucose into your blood if you already have glucose in your blood via food, right? When you have low levels of these, obviously, um, that's also a signal. So it basically tells the neurons to increase food intake, decrease energy expenditure. And it also tells your liver to release more glucose into your blood. Okay? Ghrelin is your hunger signal. It's produced by your stomach. 
when your stomach's empty, it basically travels from the blood to the hypothalamus and tells you, hey, I'm hungry, I want to eat, right? And then when you eat food, the levels of blood glucose uh, will regulate the level of, of ghrelin in your stomach. Right? So eating, if you fill your stomach, your stomach stops producing ghrelin, you don't get that signal to your, to your brain, so you're not hungry after you eat. Right? So insulin and ghrelin are actually your short-term hunger and satiety signals. All right, so they control your day-to-day -day hunger and your satiety. Okay? So you can see here the chart. This is plasma ghrelin in your blood over time. And obviously, it spikes right before meals. You eat, and then it immediately drops right afterwards. Very short-term. Right? Same thing with insulin. A little different, though. Yes? This is part of the circadian rhythm. So it's re being regulated a little bit by your circadian rhythm. You wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I haven't eaten in X number of hours. I feel hungry. That's part of the circadian rhythm, yes. Insulin is similar, right, in that it spikes. But it spikes actually right after you eat. So it doesn't spike but before you eat. It spikes right after you eat, tells you I'm full for a very short ter term. And then it drops back to a level until the ghrelin signal. So it's actually telling you, oh, I'm stopping, the, uh, I'm stopping eating. And actually, I um, it's been postulated, I'm not 100% sure if it's been confirmed, that actually this spike in insulin is, is indirectly or directly regulating this drop in ghrelin. So they kind of play off each other. So they, they're known to be correlative, but they're not known which is causative. OK, okay so what about, I've talked about insulin, ghrelin, short-term hunger and satiety. What about leptin? Leptin's interesting because it actually it's all about your long-term appetite metabolism. Okay, so in a normal functioning human being, if you have weight loss, you have reduced leptin levels. And what reduced leptin levels do will tell you, hey, I'm starving. I don't have, your fat cells are starving, literally. So they'll tell your body to increase the food ex intake and actually decrease the energy expenditure. So your metabolism goes down, you get hungrier, and your appetite increases long term. All right? And so this is a good example of this. They literally, uh, like, this is a mouse that they've, if you um, overexpress, actually, no, uh, this is the mouse. Forget, hold on a second. Um, if you take away the gene that produces leptin, um, it thinks it's starving all the time. So it'll actually keep on eating, 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 and overeat. And it turns into this mouse. So that's actually a disorder that can be found in humans. You can actually have. Um, misregulation of your leptin production. And there's actually uh, leptin supplementation is actually the treatment for that. And we'll talk about that as, as part of treatment. 